please turn off your cell phones or put them on vibrate. We've used uh, the game Civilization as uh, an example of a number of things throughout this uh, year. I know a number of you are fans of the game. Interesting article popped up on Gamma Sutra talking about how they specifically utilize the technology in order to uh, really not just improve gameplay, but improve your experience of the game and keep you more engaged in play. And they talk about a number of the ways they do this, uh, the feeling of progression that goes through it, an interesting asymmetrical aspect to it, and so forth. Um, one reason I'm pointing this out is you've all been doing a fairly good job with the blog entries, focusing on one specific mechanic. This is an example of a much larger blog entry on one very specific mechanic. So if you want to see how you could take what you've been doing and make it much larger and more informative, I think this is a great example of it. But I also think he does a very good job of analyzing how one very uh, specific game aspect can have such a strong impact on the rest of the game. One of the things we always try and focus on is how to keep players constantly involved with the game. Engaged is usually the term for that. How do you keep them from looking here and not looking over at the TV screen or whatever monitor is playing YouTube or listening to the music, or walking up to get a sandwich or anything else? We do want them to go to the bathroom, but we like them to focus on our game over all those other uh, needs. So I like how he talks about this ensuring constant progress for the player. There's something, uh, Civ always benefits from constantly giving the players something they want within a couple turns, and the technology aspect is a big, a big part of that. I'm going to have a technology that's going to let me make tanks. I'm really excited. Or chariots early in the game, or some great wonder, or something like that. It forces the game to always feel, as it, the author says, like there's constantly moving forward. Never makes you feel like you're stuck in the rut just doing the same things over and over again. Thank you. There's always something going on. And then that ties to the idea of meaningful rewards. That each of these technologies in some way gives you something important. If it doesn't give you a new unit, a new building, a new wonder, it's the unlock to open up the other technologies that do. It's your pathway, your gateway into the others. So there are a lot of different things, a lot of different rewards they can give you with these various technologies. And it's an interesting aspect of what are player rewards. It is a very intangible, but at the same time, making these technology breakthroughs really are, uh, really are important player rewards and not just in-game uh, technologies. And I'm amused by the author's uh, complaints. Things like aircraft upgrades don't just have enough of an impact in a normal game for me. They nerfed fighter jets for him or something like that. I don't know. But uh, it's always interesting because different gameplays will create different... Uh, feelings of how you, uh, what matters to you and what doesn't. And uh, I like the way the author then talks about how this ties to the theme of the game itself. The idea of how humanity progresses through history, which is very much the focus of civilization, the march of time, the march of progress, the march of humanity, moving forward, becoming better, stronger, healthier, etc. And uh, this could be done in a variety of different ways, but he thinks that the technology tree very much feeds exactly that example. Uh, and then he complains about things like uh, the uh, complexity, how things are static, and how it would be interesting to change between games and so forth. But in the end, and it talks about alternatives, and that's an interesting aspect to it as well but really focuses on how this one element feeds the rest of the game and major aspects of the game. So since I've been reading through a lot of blogs and mainly watching the online vlogs, I found this is an excellent example of how you could really expand on that if you wanted to. So if folks are interested in this one, I'll send them the link if they want to continue their blogs after this class. Is there someone outside? Sure enough. Continue this, uh, these blogs after the class is done. All right, a, sec a second uh, article I wanted to go into made its uh, appearance here today directly related to what we're talking about today in class, which is the idea of games as art. 
and uh, was very amused. It's as if uh, this person had read the chapter we're about to and decided to go ahead and comment on it accordingly in the various uh, readings that go along with it. Um, I, I tend to think that the idea of whether games are art or not has been very well settled. As a gamer, obviously, I have my own conceit that it's clear and evident, and that I find it a surprise that anyone would think otherwise. But at this point, I find Burns's comment right here that games are culturally accepted now, and we really influence other pop culture at this point, Ready Player One being the most blatant example, but uh, we like to talk about how Madden influences sports, people play football based on how they've played the Madden game now, we influence uh, uh, how people study history, how people study war, and so forth. So we tend to think that it's obvious, but apparently there's still some people who are not as convinced that games are art, or it even matters if uh, games are art. Which uh, I think brings an interesting argument. He argues against the idea that there are some people feel it doesn't matter if games are art or not. It's a tempting argument, but I think Burns makes a good case for the fact that we need to think of games as art, that games should express something important and something that speaks to uh, humanity and not just be considered toys. So I think there are a lot of toys that are artistic in their orientation and uh, creation. So Burns does what some of our others readings have discussed, which is A, trying to define what art is, which we've already seen isn't really doable, uh, but uh, then gets into the idea of art as a product versus art as a process, which is kind of, uh, for those of you who have read the readings where they talk about the, um, the uh, classic Ebert argument, the games are not art because there's, the player is the one creating it, there's not really the artist there. Uh, he does a good job of talking about the idea of the process and the product both being an artistic aspect for game development. And uh, does a nice job at the end for talking about how critics inside and outside the industry are beginning to look more and more at the idea of games as art. And uh, I did kind of sort of like the very conclusion of this article. After all, a work of art is not one because it magically possesses a mystical quality other objects don't have. Art is art because it constitutes a record of the artistic process having taken place. In other words, an artist created it, you as game designers created it, and here is your artistic expression for the world to enjoy and interact with, with like some people interact with uh, Michelangelo David by walking around and, and examining it. The reason I highlighted this article today is this is still an issue. And I'm always surprised that it is, that there is still this question of are games art and what kind of art are they? And I think when you're within the industry, we can even take a deeper look at it and say what sort of art are different games. Uh, civilization compared to uh, Darfur is Dying, compared to Oregon Trail, compared to Mario, compared to other titles. What sort of response do they evoke? What was involved in the process? I just saw a nice article recently on a bunch of the best-looking hand-drawn games that are out there from indie developers right now. A lot of gorgeous games out there with just the very visual appeal is clearly artistic, is clearly art. And then the playing of them even more so. Uh, the same with how the music is incorporated into games uh, these days really brings that artistic element uh, to the fore to a greater and greater degree. So we're going to talk about games as art in terms of chapter 17 in the readings today. But even after you're out of this class, take a look at the games you play, get a sense of what feeling they evoke in you, and when you're making games, try and keep that sense going forward of what are you going to try to invoke in your players. All right, any questions on either the Civilization article or the games as art? being redressed yet again. It is a topic that pops up less and less often now, but has still not gone away, so it's worth uh, keeping in mind. Oh, I'm sorry, I did have a few other important announcements before I get into Chapter 17. Uh, we're going to be having a live stream for the Game, uh, game Developer News Network, Tuesday night 
April 24th on Mixer.com slash Georgia Game Devs, highlighting not only news nationally and news within the Georgia game industry, but also some of the jobs that are coming on the market right now for gamers, high res, tripwire, a lot of, pretty much every studio in town is hiring these days. So that'll be a part of the discussion. So if you want to tune on into it, it should be a pretty interesting discussion. Uh, let's talk about the final exam. So I was given the wrong time by administration as to when our exam would be. So our exam will actually be May 2nd from 8.30, uh, 8.30, hold on, let me pull it out. They've given me a new document, sent me an email saying we're sorry. Let's see. I believe it is 8.30 to 10.30. Yeah, nice early exam. On, uh, oh, in the morning. no, no, PM, PM, PM. Oh, goodness gracious, no. I don't expect any of you to be alive then without a gun being put to your head, <laughs> BFG or otherwise. Oh, let's see where that went. And I ran up and gotten the documentation of that after I heard the, the change in plans. No. My, uh, my thought that we would do it online, and I know you all had hoped to do it online, uh, I've been told that that is definitely a day when we are supposed to meet. <laughs> so, May 2nd, I believe it is 8.30 to 10.30. I will confirm that with you today. <coughs> Excuse me. I have, the, I have the actual sheet from them now, so we can talk about it. But we will indeed be doing it in class. And I will, uh, <coughs> we will have an exam review next week uh, before you have your presentations of the games. The review, the exam will cover both the first part of the semester, pre-midterm and post-midterm. <coughs> so expect a fair amount of each. Uh, a few of you have also asked about getting extra credit in this class. So generally, I would prefer that you come to me with extra credit proposals and we discuss what that would be worth and so forth. So if you have ideas, you are welcome to do so. One thing I've used successfully in other classes, and I'm willing to go ahead and use with you, is to allow you to comment on Gamma Sutra articles and other articles focusing on game design. If you comment on five online articles, send me the links to your comments, and comment intelligently, the level of intelligence being at my discretion, I'll go ahead and turn one quiz grade, your lowest quiz grade, into a 100. So uh, that's usually the easiest form of extra credit. So you have that opportunity. It doesn't have to be Gamma Sutra. Gamma Sutra is just a very good example because there are constant articles there on game design. If you want to use another source like game skinny or something like that let me know uh most certainly good but again i do want them to be game design related this is a, a game design class so that is your opportunity for an easy extra credit and i'm open to other ideas as well uh digital to physical so you have your grades for digital to physical uh, most of those were fairly good. If you have problems seeing grades or you don't have a grade, let me know. I'm assuming they were all saved appropriately. Uh, most of you did a fairly nice job with those. One thing that I did notice was that uh, one of the issues I had with a number of the, the writings was that the writing was pretty imprecise. I couldn't tell what you often meant, especially when you're talking about rules. So, for instance, roll a die is unclear when I don't know what kind of die you're talking about. So I do want you to get to that level of precision with the writing. Roll a d10 or something along those lines. Um, looking forward to your presentations uh, next week for the projects. When you are doing those presentations, you are going to be presenting as if you are pitching to the investor who's been behind this and making all those weird requests early on anyway. So this is a pitch. You're going to be talking about your game, why it is so excellent, 
You are providing a number of uh, other basic business uh, elements when you're turning in what you turn in, so have that in mind. We'll talk a little bit more about this when we break into groups, but I also want to ensure that you're very clear on your writing for what you submit to me, be able to tell me exactly what is uh, meant and the rules are quite clear. Your question, thank you. Uh, is there That's a great, great request. Yes, let me uh, grab some online for you. In the uh, Georgia Game Developer Association YouTube channel, we have a number of pitches from people who have pitched at companies in the past, or pitched at our investment conference in the past. So some of those are good. Some of them are not. So I'll dig up a good one to share, or a few good ones to share, and I'll put and those in the announcements. As far as the design documents, um, I was looking, and some of my games uh, will have audio cues. Um, so for things that it will have, uh, what do I do with this kind of? So whenever there's a section that does not apply, you write NA, not applicable. Okay. And if I believe you're wrong, that's going to cost you points. Now, again, I don't expect you to go into tremendous detail. For instance, there's an area you put an asset list, and in a real game, that would be thousands upon thousands of items within that asset class, all within their asset list, all with their own specific names. I do expect you to list what kind of assets you need, weapons, uh, armor, uh, etc. But I'm not going to be too worried if you don't get into incredible detail there. All right. Any other comments or questions about those? I'm going to give you some more instructions when we get down to actually breaking into teams. But that's the basic overview. All right. Let's talk about games as art. So who has played a game they would think had real artistic merit and why? Yes. Journey. Why Journey. Artistic in its visuals. And in the storytelling elements, probably the sound also does a very good job of uh, putting you into that uh, immersive role. How about how it makes you feel? How does it make you feel? Um, it's that kind of struggle, like at the end of the journey, where you're going through ice and like you come, finally come out and you're just all so much better and like just crescendo. So you feel the success, the thrill of uh, success at the end of the journey, as well as the culmination of a long journey, uh, those emotions well in you as part of it. Someone, someone else wants to talk about a game that they think has artistic merit. Yes? Uh, Metal Gear Solid 3. Metal Gear Solid 3, why? Uh, you like the cinematics. People say that uh, a movie can be considered art. I would think that, in a way, games like that can be considered art if they want to count one the other one. Like, uh, not ladder scene. But are you only talking about the cinematics? You're talking about the interactivity. Even the interactivity, like it's just a way to progress the story, and in the way that like the story is progressed, you're able to influence what might happen. But in the end, the end result, I, it, in this game in particular, it's the same. So, um, it's just it's like a story with one end, a movie with an ending that you have to work to get to. So the emotional resonance of that game impacts you even during the play, and not just during the cinematics. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, braid. Braid. Excellent. How so? Uh, music and uh, animation uh, and art itself is extremely pretty, but also the way the story like entwines as you go through and as you actually realize at the end that everything was in reverse is really cool and impactful. Well, excellent. And what do you feel about the uh, your relationship to time by playing that game? It was really cool, honestly. I like. I did like how you had to figure out the puzzles, and sometimes you had to basically kill yourself in order to actually get to the point that you need to be at, and stuff like that. So it was really neat. It's a classic painting of uh, clocks essentially melting, a classic dolly painting. A beautiful piece of art, but I had a friend talk to 
talked to me about playing Braid, and it makes you rethink your relationship with time, which is very much what Braid does. If you haven't played Braid, great indie game, well worth uh, picking up an Humble Bundle or elsewhere and, uh, and puzzling through. Others uh, of a game they think is artistic. And, uh, yes? I'd say probably Undertow and its approach to uh, mechanics. Undertow and its approach to its mechanics, how so? Um, it, uh, it gives you the option, like, and it doesn't explicitly tell you at the beginning that there's any certain way that you're supposed to play through it. But it's the option of either completely going through the game without killing anything, or going through slaughtering everyone, or just going through it normally. And the ending can change depending on how you react to the game. And that, I believe, has a stronger emotion as a player than any of the other games I've played where it usually has a set linear path and a set outcome every time. So that's an interesting point. So one thing I've seen in games with multiple endings, I often feel more invested in them if I'm willing to go through and play to those alternate endings. Uh, and those endings are more meaningful to me than if it's just a game I'm playing for the first time. When I put that extra time in, it has more impact. I care more about those endings when I get to them. So uh, definitely something I've always enjoyed as a player. All right. So that's a nice quick look at what you see as games as art. Let's talk about the quiz, and then let's talk about what the various authors in the uh, assignment saw as games as art. So, games as art. Okay, okay, go. Trying to get away from me. The central theme in the game Passage is uh, A, passage through a maze, B, passage of time, C, passage of space and matter, D, both A and B. Both A and B, passage through a maze and passage of time. And I like to think that one of the things they're talking about is that time itself is a sort of a maze for us. I think that's one of the uh, underlying themes of passage, which isn't that obvious. How many of you had a chance to play Passage and went through the link that was up on the, uh, ah. I didn't know there was a game. Pardon? I didn't know there was a game. Yeah, yeah, on the, uh, I had, I had, I had played it on the, on the, uh, the assignments. Yes, you have a link to the game in there. All right. Next question. What type of medium uh, our games. Expressive, Expressive, conductive, etheric, or formulative? Expressive. Expressive medium. What does that mean? Yes. Very much. It's the whole idea the artist has a way to express themselves. What I like about games is it also gives the audience a way to directly express themselves. But yes, it is very much about uh, the artist, the designer, expressing him or herself. All right. Why did Roger Ebert say games are not art? A... Uh, no, A, games abdicate authorship to the player. B, games like sports and sports are not art. C, games focus on competition rather than the solitary experience. D, because a game is made up of mechanic system goals and unartistic elements. Games abdicate authorship to the player. E needs to play a lot more games, or needed to. In Clint Hawking's defense of games as art, he compares games to orchestral comp composition. In his analogy, which is true? A, the designer is the composer, the player is the conductor, the orchestra is the hardware, the so sheet music is the software. B, MIDI music is like Mozart, 8-bit music is like Bach, Dolby stereo is like Debussy, surround sound is like Stravinsky. C, platformers are like pop music, FPS games are like heavy metal, puzzle games are like punk, and RPGs are like symphonies. Or D, mobile games are like humming, PC games are like singing, console games are like drumming, and eSports are like choral arrangements. A, absolutely. Designer is the composer, player is the conductor. 
I like that analogy. It's the player who's waving their arms around frantically and generally being heckled by Bugs Bunny if it was a cartoon. The orchestra is the hardware and the sheet music is the software. Which of these is not a positive trend in the game industry exemplified by responses to the Super Columbine Massacre RPG? Uh, a, it is challenging the mainstream and specialist gaming press to discuss games as an artistically potent medium. B, it is introducing the notion of games as art to progressive non-gamers. C, it is introducing game designers to new notions about games can be. D, it's introducing game designers to new levels of criticism. What was that? That's uh, right. D is the only one that would not be a positive of that uh, of that game. All right, again, fairly... Uh, good grades on the quizzes. Kept this one pretty short, uh, but uh, obviously a fair amount of content within the chapters and the readings to go over. So let's talk again about uh, games as art. It's very interesting because um, Brenda Brathwaite has done a number of games with a very strong level of impact. Games about uh, the Irish coming to America of Escaping the Potato Famine, games about uh, the Holocaust, uh, games about Playboy Mansion. She's never been afraid to tackle more difficult subjects in a game medium. I think her games have done a great job at having a strong impact on their audience. So that's why I like her attempt to define what an art game is, uh, a game created to make an artistic statement or with artistic intent. To some degree, all games can be considered art games, since games themselves are a form of interactive art. In contrast to traditional games, though, games classified as art games tend to feature designs that purposefully don't fit neatly with any particular genre or within the conventions we expect of a particular genre. So I found it interesting, well, and this is something that they don't really go into in the book, that there seem to be a few different types of art games. One of the ways to break them down is to think of art games that are meant for a general public, and then art games that are really meant for serious gamers. So Journey, I would argue, is an art game meant for the general public. Easy interface, console release, uh, had a, the opportunity to hit a big audience, and um, it did not have a lot of points that would stop you from playing. You would keep going. What I've seen a lot of artistic games that are meant for hardcore gamers is they can be a lot more, um, they could have some more obstacles. Braid, I don't think he really would consider that an art game. He definitely was trying to make the best game he possibly could. It is an art game, and it's definitely a game meant for serious gamers. Folks are willing to sit there and think through puzzles, uh, and it's not a good game to pick up as your first game. Journey is a great game to pick up and be your first game. Uh, Braid, not so much. You will get frustrated with that in a heartbeat and either be online looking for cheats or throwing it away. So you'll see games uh, described as art games that are definitely meant for a dedicated fan base. We'll spend some time with them uh, as opposed to a general audience. So I like being able to break up the description that way. And I wish this chapter had dealt with that a little more. Because as you develop your own titles, you'll be thinking very clearly about the audience you're aiming to. And can you make a game artistic when you're reaching out to a general audience as opposed to an audience that really knows your area? And that's what I think uh, Brathway and Schreiber are referring to here when they talk about how art games often do not neatly fit into our existing genres. It's because the game designers are trying to challenge what the gamers usually think of as a game. Uh, and they do a good job of making the point that graphics are not the only artistic elements in the game. The music you've talked about, the stories we've talked about, the interactive experience I think are all important in it. And it's always interesting to see how they can be combined to, uh, to have that sort of impact. And I think the uh, last point they make before they turn it over to other authors is the idea of what's the role of games? Is there a role for games beyond fun? Many of you are very happy when you're done with a frustrating game, or a frustrating game of school, a frustrating day of school, 
to get in front of a console, blow some things up, build some things, solve puzzles, let your mind flow away and drift and relax. Is there supposed to be an artistic challenge within that? And I'd argue that games like Journey and Braid are perfect examples of how you can do that, where the idea is after a frustrating day at work, school, wherever, you can jump into a very satisfying game, experience a new reality, feel it fill you in different ways, get something from it, uh, keep your brain, emotions, and everything else turned on while you have an escape from everything else. So I think they are very easy to combine, but uh, they make a good point that Games don't get artistic games aren't necessarily meant to be easy escapes or diversions. They are meant to engage you. And one thing I'll say about all the game examples we had today, these are games that really engage the player and keep them focused throughout. Journey is definitely that way. Braid definitely that way. Metal Gear definitely that way. Uh, onward, yeah, mostly. Um, so I think that on a game with strong artistic elements has a very strong level of engagement for the players, which in the end is one of the main things you want to create as a game designer. More engaged the player is, more time they'll spend with it, more money they'll spend on it, and so on, and the more they'll enjoy it, and the more you'll be satisfied with your own creation. So let's talk about uh, uh, the Passage game. And I'm very sorry, yeah, we, we did have the ability to, um, <coughs> to actually Play. Let me make sure that link is still working. We had that issue last week. Pardon? Uh, let's see if I can download on these machines. Load it. You can install it on these computers. Uh, that'll take you all of 30 seconds, apparently. We'll go to 10, take to 720. Go. I want everyone to go ahead and play Passage. Yes, I know, you hate being told to play games in class, but you can suffer through it. And you can play it as a multiplayer experience, and not like you're head-to-head, -head, but in the sense that both of you are on the same keyboard talking about it. I'm all in favor of you sharing your thoughts and comments with each other. Impressions of Passage. Um, Very simple, indeed. Meaningful. Meaningful. Talk about that. Um, despite it having not having a lot of mechanics, it does like it does. You can obviously see like it's trying to convey a message more than just. Um, a greater message than accumulate wealth. That there is yeah. another aspect to reality than just racking up points. Yeah. All right. Uh, anyone else have that same sort of sense? This is a more meaningful game in some way. I certainly find this to be a more satisfying game in many ways. It definitely feels like there's a much larger story. We talked before about storytelling. The most important stories you can have are those that the player can create. And Passage is a perfect platform on which you can do that. There is no story given. I was making the joke about you don't know the genders of these. That's because one's wearing a dress. That doesn't mean it's necessarily female. But I actually think that's important, that the story doesn't, the game does not explain these. It is creating a platform on which a player can project the story. And Roger Ebert might say that makes it not artistic. And I think from a game designer perspective, that makes it even more artistic. It is an even greater platform for stories and emotional uh, experiences. And when we talk about this being a meaningful game, there definitely feels like there's more meaning to it than even in an excellent Mario game. There's more out there in the one uh, procedurally generated level you play through than in a pretty significant Mario game. So other thoughts on this game? You've all played Progression, so you should have a few good comments on it. Passage, yes, the game you just played. You call it Progression? I call it Progression? All right, sorry, Passage. Passage and progression, those will be two good ones. And then regression for the next, uh, the, tr the third part of the trilogy. All right, other thoughts on passage? There must be a few others, yes. Quiet in the back, please. Right. Someone is telling you to keep walking. I 
and they're like, oh, by the way, I'm going to take away your legs, and you have to, like, hobble, well, but you're still walking, and you have to walk in a cake, taking things away, and they'll slowly, like, take your entire being away. Like, it's, it was a really, really weird game, but I was like, whatever, it, it counts time. It was just, like, it run, reminds me of this game. All right. That's a, that, let me uh, let's unpack that a little bit more. Because there are other games I've seen try to do this. I think Passage does it in a very good way. It, this is a game where you, you play it and you feel like you've actually kind of accomplished something. Something has been done. And I've seen other games that have tried to be cute without actually having an impact on their players. Do you feel there is an emotional difference between the two games? Yeah. Since you're the one who played the two games. Do you feel there's an emotional difference between the games? One thing I've seen is when artistic games try and be too cute, for instance, for no reason, they're taking away your legs and whatever. It's like, okay, this, this feels more game-like rather than art-like, whereas this feels like it speaks more to life. I mean, sometimes when I play games like Passage, that one other game I was talking about, I kind of get to the point where I'm like, okay, where's the end of the game? <laughs> The engagement is lacking, despite the artistic elements. That's a good point. All right, other thoughts on Passage. How many people found it in some way different in a positive way than most of the games you play? No. <laughs> Just not attractive, bad audio, not much in the way of gameplay. All right. All right. Terrible graphics. No <laughs> story. <laughs> yeah. You hate the what? <laughs> Too much walking. When another student's talking. Gotcha. All right. Good to know. All right. One, pardon? Why can't you? Where's sprint mode? Where's tumble? Why can't I hide? Why can't I crouch? All right, so what, what's an example? You, you've played some? Um, I'm to the movies, like following right. Johnny to like childhood to death. Right. And I think that it gets you engaged in his life, it gets you engaged in Boomer's life, and with this you're just watching two people like move around without actually doing anything. You move them out of the way of obstacles, but it doesn't keep their attention for very long. Right. To a degree, Oregon Trail has a more compelling life story that goes through it. You had a comment as well? Oh, I was going to say the three others are like the Sims. The Sims? That's a pretty light progression right there. Yeah. The entire intro sequence to Fallout 3 is you yeah. own your character to. The intro sequence to Fallout 3 is a good example of building up. You don't go through the full life progression, obviously. You reach the peak of your skills and go out. Yeah. All right. But you have read, played Passage now. It's a good time to reread the Passage discussion and see if you think differently about that one. All right. Let's talk about Columbine. The game. So the idea that there's a Columbine... How many people, before you read this chapter, knew there was a game about Columbine? I heard about it. For those of you who did not know there was a game about Columbine, what did just the idea that there's a game about Columbine make you feel? You felt it was too edgy. Well, I felt like not that it was too edgy, but like the kid that was making it was meant to be like as a joke or a meme. Joke or a meme? You were saying when it first came out, you feel it was probably pushing too hard. Yeah. Now that there's some distance to that, and we've accepted games a bit more as an artistic uh, element, that uh, it's more acceptable. Other comments on just the idea of there being a game about Columbine? Yes? There is a game about trying to shower with the correct father. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah the, the exact, that I'll section of point in case, like, there's so many games now that I got that, that trends that path. Push so, the edge. I'm secret say, secret gonna, Hitler, the board game. And this is going to bring that up. You also got to bring up Jennifer Jones. Oh, oh, yeah. No, no you no, don't. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you got to bring up Mountain Friends. Must be honest. So yes, uh, you are making very good points. That there are a lot more boundary pushy games now than there were in the past, which is part of why I think Columbine did uh, have such a. It did raise a bit of a uh, firestorm at the time. I definitely remember it. I was very active in the industry then. Um, my own games had been some of those blamed for Columbine, uh, not exactly Doom level, but Vampire was certainly considered uh, one of the things that they wanted to sue over and so forth. So. Uh, but you're right, now we do see games on a lot more topics than we had at that same point in time. But uh, when the game came out, Columbine had, was a few years past already. But uh, it definitely created, uh, reopened a lot of wounds um, and emotional scars along when it came out. So it was very interesting seeing that reaction. And I think that uh, the two articles you have on Columbine make a good point that uh, even though Columbine wasn't a particularly good game, it did positively drive the industry forward. And the fact that the industry could react to the idea of the Columbine game without trying to necessarily have to distance itself from it. We could accept that there was a place for a game like Columbine within the industry and not just try to say, that, well, the classic example was uh, a game called Night Trap, which came out very early CD game, and it was basically a uh, voyeuristic try and peek on people in their windows game. Not much gameplay to it, and there was a lot of complaints about it. Games are horrible. It's all about uh, the TNA in it. It's all about this voyeuristic aspect to it, and the industry distanced itself from this immediately because there really wasn't much game to any to it anyway. It wasn't a good game. Nobody wanted to claim it as part of our industry, whether it was. Uh, voyeuristic or not, it just wasn't a good game. Columbine, not a great game, was good enough that folks were willing to embrace it and take it in. So it also showed the evolution of the industry, that we felt now there was a place for games like this. Uh, I think the reading on Columbine is a, uh, is a fairly nice look also at the impact of the game. So... Uh, Take a look. There are videos online of the Columbine game. It's a well, harder one to try and get a copy of. I haven't seen the actual gameplay in about a decade now. But uh, I know you can still dig it up if you want to. So The uh, other interesting flip on that, we were working with a publisher who was doing a game called Postal, which actually did come out at one point. It had Gary Coleman as a voice actor in it. And as opposed to the Columbine designer, who did have an idea that he was going to push something artistically when he released it. The Postal folks were very clear. They were going to make the most over-the-top, violent game they could, just like you can think of all the over-the-top, violent movies that you can. There have been a few of those, but you're just trying to go over the top in the sense that the most violent martial arts and uh, gun flicks go completely over the top. Hatred. Hatred. You're not going to try and say there's a huge, the, the designers are not going to say there's a huge artistic element to it, just that it's a lot of fun to get that crazy and wild with the game. So it's interesting to compare what the designers are trying to do in both those. And to be honest, the postal folks thought that by having the most violent game anyone had released, they would sell more units accordingly. The controversy certainly helped them. The fact that their level design wasn't bad helped them. There was some fun gameplay in it. Uh, definitely helped them. I'm still not sure that just being the most violent game helped them that much. I think they would have done better with even better gameplay. But uh, Patrick Dugan's article on um, uh, why you owe the Columbine game and Ian Bogos' article Ian Bogos, by the way, is local. He's over at Georgia Tech and writes a lot of good books on game design. Uh, well worth checking out his work and other things. I think combined are a very good look at what is a game that to a degree forced the industry to step up and say we can have a place for games like this. 
We don't necessarily want that to be the case because we get a lot of flack for it, but there is a place for these sorts of games. And that is the focus of the, the Dugan article, talking about how it did challenge the media and did force uh, folks to look at games in a different way. I think he could have been, I think the designer could have been more obvious in making a commentary on Columbine than he did, but uh, he certainly proved that there was a place for what he was trying to create. All right. Uh, Clint Hawking's article, I think, is the guts of this chapter. And I think he does a very good job not just addressing the Ebert controversy about our game's art, but also in talking about our game's art and what makes them artistic. And this and other people's analysis, like the one we looked at today uh, from Gamma Sutra, I think have been the best effects of the Roger Ebert comment. The fact that Roger Ebert said games are not art forced a lot of people who just felt intuitively that games were art to put it on paper to express exactly why they thought games were art. We hadn't, we'd had that internal discussion. Yeah, sure, games are art. Of course they're artistic. Just look at them. We hadn't had to really classify it out. We hadn't had to put it on paper and really express that argument in a way that other people who are not gamers could understand. The Clint Hawking one is often turned to as uh, one of the, uh, the, artic the articles that really sets out a framework for how games are art. Uh, pretty interesting that U Ubisoft has just bought a local company, so we we'll hope that helps the art side of games. Interesting that Ubisoft is a French company, which has, well, it's hard to say a lot of the Ubisoft games really focus on the art side. Hard to say a Tom Clancy game is really focusing on games as art. Certainly, they're going to be strong proponents of the idea that games can be artistic. So anyone want to talk about some of the, the core arguments about that hockey makes about why games are art? Anyone want to dig into the hockey discussion? Well, he pulls up a number of good arguments talking about uh, the, the emotions and the form of art. In games, the artist uh, does not only create the specific case, can tell more than just one story along the way. The artist is also capable of creating an entire expressive system space that explores the potential infinity of different notions of freedom and liberty. What well, we're talking about, all these different paths that you can offer a player to explore, lets you take that book, you said, well, what would it have felt like if the book had ended in a different way, and let you actually experience these. Part of the reason I think games like Mass Effect have had such a, a following is people do want to go ahead and dig through all these different ways you could have done, taken the journey, read the story, experienced the entire story. I'm not going to say every game wants to go that route, but, uh, but it's certainly one to look at as designers. When you're creating these different paths, why are you creating them? Are they meaningful to the players? At the end of the Hawking article, well, I shouldn't say exactly at the end, along the way to the end, he makes a, a comment on Ebert's statement. I believe art is created by an artist. If you change it, you become the artist. And as Hawking notes, he's implying that interacting with the work is the same as changing it. But I think Hawking makes a great point to say that's not the case. A, that it was art when I created it. If it was art then, if the player can change it, then it's still art. And B, it reverts to that original form, allowing other people to experience it in a whole new way. Um, the whole idea of that's what flows into the idea of the symphony. There is an art. The best analogy is again in the uh, that of symphony. There's an art in the composing of the symphony itself. The creation of the song and the recording of the instructions for reproducing that song using a symphony orchestra. Yet because of the comparative fuzziness of the transcription, there's often a high degree of malleability in interpretation of those instructions. And the ability to interpret those instructions well and to facilitate an orchestra actually play the symphony is an artistic task. Just heard a very interesting story about a great pianist who had been told to play. There's a composer, Ravel, very well-known composer, uh, piano works 
who've been told to play it in a specific way. Ravel had always wanted people to play it in a specific way. He played it, thought it sounded horribly playing it that way. So he played it his own way, loud, bombastic, whereas Ravel had wanted it much more subdued. Didn't understand why Ravel had had those instructions in there. So Ravel died a while ago, but Ravel's house is set up as a museum, and the original piano is there. So the pianist goes to Ravel's house, is offered the opportunity to play on Ravel's piano, plays that piece, plays it all out, and then realizes that he's sitting in essentially a 12 by 10 room instead of a concert hall. Concert hall is huge, much bigger than this room. 12 by 12 room is significantly smaller than this room. And it sounds completely different being played the way the creator wanted it to be played. If you're playing it in Ravel's parlor, you have to play in a subdued way for it to sound what good. If you play it all out like you should play in a symphony hall, you, it's, a, it's an awful cacophony. Uh, and I thought that was a very interesting look at how we as game designers work. We have a view of how we think a game should be played, and that's going to be fun and satisfying. And as soon as players get a hold of it, everything changes. Uh, anyone who's ever been a game master for role-playing game is very used to this. You have a wonderful scenario laid out for the players. You know exactly what's going to happen. And as soon as you put them loose on the world, they want to go somewhere else and kill the king as opposed to going to the dungeon to save the prince or whatever. The same is true with the players in your games, and I think that's part of what makes this probably the most enjoyable art. We're going to create these symphonies where we think we know the perfect way to play them, and you're going to find that your players will come up with much better ways than you ever did. And this was certainly has been my experience in my games. My players' stories of the games are far more interesting than my own, and for games uh, like... Um, the Noble Armada game you've seen, we're putting out the campaign editor specifically to see what stories our players create with it that'll be better than anything we, the professional paid designers, would have created. And giving players the space to do that, I think, is still probably the most, uh, the greatest benefit we give them and the most fun of the games we create. So, with that, we are now at 741. We'll go ahead and take it. Nine minute break, be back here at uh, 7.50 and uh, we will see the Brathwaite video.